Hello everyone, my name is Muhammad Dia and I'm going to talk to you about automation. Quick introduction about myself, as I said my name is Muhammad and you can find me by this handle on Twitter, GitHub and pretty much everything else. I'm a bug hunter, web developer and tool creator, you can find some of my tools on GitHub. So in terms of what we're going to talk about today, we'll start with why we need automation, what we can automate, then we will talk about monitoring, after that I'll show you how I automate a part of my hunting methodology, and we will talk a little bit about a project I'm currently working on, and we will wrap it up with some advice for the, commu for the whole InfoSec community. Okay, so let's get started with why we need automation. First, because boredom is a bad thing, especially when your job is to be creative and solve new problems. Eric Raymond wrote about that in his How to Become a Hacker post. He said that hackers and creative people in general should never be bored or have to drudge at stupid repetitive work because when this happens it means they're not, do they're not doing what only they can do solve new problems and not only does their period of work waste our time but also our energy I mean how many times have you found yourself so tired after spending too much time on the recon that you couldn't dig into anything and decided to just call it a day that's one of the things that came up in Matthias's AMA with bug bounty forum he said that this is exactly what he used to do um, spend too much time on the recon, get tired, nothing gets done. Um, the third reason, which is my personal favorite, is that automation can help you to the theory quickly. Like what James Kittle did in the Cracking the Lens research. He collected every host that he could hack legally, aka bug bounty programs, and he tried his new attack technique on all of them, which was very useful for the research for two reasons. One, he could prove that this issue could be found in the wild and real world environments, and two, some servers responded in, uh, in a bizarre way to his probes, which kind of led him deeper down the rabbit hole and made him see more variations of this issue. And the fourth and last reason which should be the most important to you if you're a full-time bug hunter is that with some automation you can monitor your targets online assets and get notified whenever they put anything new online. Which can give you an edge over other hunters who don't know that this thing even came online. Um, some successful hackers do this already like Nathaniel and Shubs who gave a talk where they shared some of their hunting techniques including monitoring and released a tool as a proof of concept for that called Asset Note. You can find it on GitHub. Okay, so now that we know how useful automation is, let's look at some things that we can automate. First, environment setup. If you have ever had to take down a server and spin up a new one, you probably know how laborious this process can be. Because it's not only downloading and installing tools, you might also need to set up, uh, set up uh, other things like a logging mechanism. Um, personally, I like to use git for logging, so when I run a tool, the tool's output gets committed and pushed to a remote server along with the command I use and the time of running. And you know having your entire environment setup uh, process automated comes in really handy especially when your IP address gets blocked by a web application firewall like Akamai. So when you get blocked you just run one command to set up a new server and carry on with what you were doing. Or you can take it a step further and allow your tools to create new servers on their own. So when you run a tool, it checks if you're blocked, if you are, it moves itself to another box and continues where it left off. Well, that could be a bit, little bit of overkill, but it's a good idea. So you have a few options here for installing tools. If you want a full-blown Kali installation, 
there's a link for that on AWS or if you are into customization and having only the tools you need you can use docker containers or good old-fashioned shell scripts there are actually some projects that are trying to manage the process of creating disposable environments um, like Terraform I haven't actually played with it yet but it looks really interesting and worth taking a look at Okay, now let's talk about reporting. So the idea of report automation boils down to one thing, creating templates for your common findings. So for example, say you find exercise a lot. So you create a template for it, which may be something like this, some general info about exercise, followed by a place for a proof of concept, a tag scenario, um, the browsers if this is done, and maybe some mitigation advice and when you actually find an XSS vulnerability you just fill in the spaces in the template and just submit it um, there are some tools already for that one of them is template generator and bug bounty templates and bounty report generator so now we have set up our environment we have set up our environment and reporting mechanism let's uh, find some actual bugs uh, in my opinion to make the best use of your tools you should chain them and um, create workflows out of them and i'll show you how to do this in just a bit but first let's talk about monitoring and the reason why the idea of monitoring is so cool is that everybody's looking at what's uh, accessible now but not so many people care about what was accessible and what will be accessible first let's start with what was um, just because a company cares about security so much now doesn't mean they have always been like that maybe they were this small startup whose developers know nothing about security and leak sensitive information everywhere so here are some tricks that i have used and found really useful first run uh, the google time filter a trick that was used by the detectify team to find an xxc vulnerability in one of google's production servers um, they wrote a blog about that you should check it out the second trick here is wayback machine and the wrapper i created around it called wayback unifier so the idea of Wayback Unifier is basically you give it a URL, it queries Wayback Machine for all the versions of this page, extracts the unique parts from each version, and creates a unified file that contains these unique parts. Um, you can use it on the robots.txt file, which is a trick shared by Zitshono, or API documentation pages as file descriptor shared in his uh, interview with P. Tiorski. also try it on javascript files um, this may mess up the syntax though but who cares about syntax when all the old endpoints and leaked api keys are still there and finally you can run it on normal html pages to find comments which may disclose sensitive information or you can find more javascript code old endpoints or old inputs like all the bug parameters that were disclosed when the application where was uh, in an early state the third information source here is um, old mobile apps so these may contain credentials or old endpoints Okay, now that we have analyzed the past, let's prepare for the future. Here are some things that you may want to monitor for changes or updates. The first one is API docs, again look for new endpoints. The, the second thing is the JavaScript code, so JavaScript code is usually the only white box part of the engagement, so you should take advantage of that fact. Updated code may contain new endpoints, um, which is a nice tip uh, given by by Yobert. And it may leak secrets or may introduce new bugs on its own. So you should like master the art of analyzing JavaScript code. 
and the third thing here is mobile app updates so again look for new endpoints and credentials that may be leaked as Arnie did uh, when he was searching for bugs in Instagram he created some sort of a change log for the endpoints that were in the in the mobile app and he tested the new ones first which was really useful for him he was successful in that in that journey and developer and engineering blogs can give you some great insight into new products and features or if they don't have a dev blog google news can work just as well um, of course these are not the only things that you can or should monitor you should keep your eyes on anything that gets updated as we will see in a minute okay as we said earlier to make the best use of your, our tools we should change them so here i've created some workflows to help familiarize you with the concept of chaining tools so the workflows will be shown as flowcharts and these are the shape mappings that i'll be using a rectangle is a tool cube is a group of tools that have similar output double square means information either given by the user by the user or generated by a tool double rectangle means a specific part of a tool's output so here let's start with the first workflow okay so you can start with a domain name a registrant e a name or, or a registrant email so if we start with the, with the domain we run a whois query on it which will give us the registrant name and registrant email then we look them each up in uh, in census and do a reverse whois query to find some more domains and we repeat this until we find every domain that could be um, remotely related to this uh, company so the second workflow here is we start with a name so remember this is the registrant name that we just collected we look it up on bgp.he.net to find IP ranges which we run mass canon to find open ports which we will use in a minute so here things start to get a little bit more complicated let's start with the shorter path we start with the domain we look it up on wayback urls which is a script that just dumps every url that wayback machine knows about a specific domain so this will find us directories some of which will be for js code which we will use in another workflow now okay when we have a domain we run some subdomain enumeration tools to find the subdomains which we then pass to all dns to like generate permutations of the of these uh, subdomains which we resolve using mass dns to find some more subdomains and while we're at it we use the mass dns output uh, we parse it and look for subdomain takeover using uh, dead dns records and after we've collected all the subdomains we resolve them to ip addresses and we run mass scan on them to find open ports which could be running an http service or not if they're not we just run some scripts to look for um, known misconfigurations or weak credentials and stuff like that if they are running an http service we run this tool called vhost scan which uh, um, uh, brute forces uh, virtual hosts at the end we will be left with live web hosts which we will start with in the, in the next workflow so here we are with the live web host we use eyewitness to uh, generate screenshots here we run some tools to look for 
um, some misconfigurations and bugs like course test, burp suite with hunt and backslash parse, parse scanner extensions. That's something that I'm still experimenting with, but I think these two extensions can be amazing together. And take it all subs to look for subdomain takeover, shocker for shell shock, and second order for second order subdomain takeover. And second order can also find us S3 buckets, which we will use in another workflow, JS code, or flash files. So if you find JS code, um, we pass it to Wayback Unifier to gain some kind of uh, an upper and above look at the this JS file, like to have all the information that have been there, like we said earlier. And then we pass it to retire the JS to look for all the libraries or DOM access scanner to find some any potential DOM XSS vulnerabilities. And we pass it to repo supervisor to look for high entropy um, strings that could be secrets or tokens. And we pass it to link finder to find endpoints. And for flash files, we uh, pass them to ParrotNG to look for some vulnerability in old Flash compilers and we decode it to action script code and we pass it to repo supervisor and link finder like what we did with the JavaScript code. And we also also pass our uh, live web hosts to Yaswo which will find us of the shell software, like the things that were not um, developed by the company itself. So if you find any of these, we try some default credentials using change me. Uh, if it's a non content management system, we run WP scan, CMS map or zoom scan. Then we use WFuzz to uh, brute force directories some of which could be javascript code and then we will run this whole workflow again and we will start in the next workflow with directories so here we are we pass them to parameth to look for parameters if we find uh, a directory that has a, a an extension that leads us to think that the server is running struts. We try strut spawn to look for the RCE that came out lately. Or if we get an access denied a message, we try to bypass the uh, the authentication using some tricks here like enum xff and we try to change case of the directory itself or add random parameters to um, to work against uh, poorly made uh, blacklists. And if all that fails, we return to good old brute force with some uh, default credentials and things like that. If we find a cross domain.xml file, we, s we parse it and see if it has a wildcard for allowed domains. If it has, that's a textbook vulnerability so it goes straight to bugs and misconfigs or if it lists specific subdomains we see if these uh, uh, some some domains we see if they exist or not if they don't that's another textbook vulnerability if it does exist we try to enumerate subdomains for the existent domains and we try to find if any of these subdomains is vulnerable to take over. If any of them is, uh, that means we can send requests from, from it to this uh, vulnerable site. And we also run backup file artifacts to look for um, backup files and stuff. If we find any, that goes to bugs and misconfigs. And it also looks for get or SVM files down there. If we find any, we pass them to DVCS Tripper. Not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Um, 
which will uh, verify if this is actually exploitable if it is it will pull any information it finds okay so remember the s3 buckets we found earlier here they will be used again we start with the company name we generate some permutations of it to look for s3 buckets then we uh, run uh, some sort of configuration scanner to look for misconfigured buckets like uh, buckets that are listable or allow for anonymous upload or delete and we didn't forget github we can uh, we like can start with the github account pass it to get all secrets and github to look for secrets and also you can use that to find some new domains or subdomains like disclosing issues and pull requests so if you find any they will be passed back to the domains workflow and subdomains workflow and the whole workflow will run again okay that's it for the workflows so now that we know how to make the best use of of our tools let's look at a project that's supposed to um, uh, help us uh, chain all these tools together so it's called bounty machine and uh, I'm working on it with uh, Anshuman and its main purpose is to allow uh, hackers to build workflows like the ones we've just seen in a modular way so you won't have to modify the code to add a new tool and it's not quite ready for use yet but it will be very soon so these are the main features it trans uh, trans tools and chains like what we've seen by passing the output of each tool to the tool like after it and again it's modular which means you can add any tool you like and you can keep it running all the time to monitor you know, like everything and if you choose to keep it running all the time uh, you can customize the notifications you get so you get notified only when it finds something interesting something worth looking at Okay, so here is how you can uh, add a new tool. Uh, you build a Docker image for your tool, you define what data it needs, what data it produces, and you specify whether you want to get notified when it finds anything, and you can optionally find a place for it in a workflow where it can work with other tools. And here is what the tool does behind uh, the scenes. It uh, runs the tool, translates its output into something that other tools can understand if the output is like can't be used already. And it checks if the output uh, has changed since the last time of running. If it has, it notifies the user about the newly found results. So we like uh, diff the files to find only the changed part. Then it passes the whole uh, new output to other tools to perform further checks and we do this all the time for all targets to keep everything monitored. Okay, so now we know how to make the best use of our tools. All what's left is to build more tools. Unfortunately, we don't do this um, as efficiently as we should and here is why. We have so much misdirected energy. We rebuilt way too many tools that are perfectly functional and don't need to be rebuilt. I mean, if you want to uh, help others and give back to the community, rebuilding an existing tool is really not the best way to go about it. Instead, you should focus on building new tools or extending existing ones. Um, based, on, based on my observation of this uh, tool rebuilding trend, these are the main reasons why I think people rebuild tools. 
One, simply they don't know there's already a tool for that function. Two, boredom, because who hasn't created something completely useless just out of boredom. Three, unmaintained projects that are just too old to use or extend to. Well, in this specific case, um, rebuilding the tool actually makes more sense than try trying to figure out how the old thing works. And for different requirements or opinions on how things should be done, which is actually um, the sweet thing about open source. It allows different opinions to evolve, which covers more use cases and also uh, provides the variety and the competition, if you will, which is like very useful and healthy for any system. Okay, apparently the last two reasons make sense, the first two not so much. So let's look at some solutions. Okay, uh, so the first reason was unawareness of the existence of tools. So what do we do? We make people aware of tools. At Bug Bounty Forum, we have collected a list of tools that uh, that has two main purposes. One, help researchers find new tools to add to their arsenal. And two, which is more relevant to our topic today, spread the word about uh, the existence of tools. So nobody would have to rebuild them. And we update it regularly whenever a new tool comes up. The second reason was boredom. So this is a new project started by Edover Flow and I. It's called Ideas and it works like this. Someone comes up with an idea for a new tool, they share it, someone else finds it, they build it. Simple as that. Um, I'm actually writing a blog post uh, about this project where I'll explain uh, how things will work in more detail and I'll make sure you check it out. Hopefully this project will allow us to have less duplicate tools. Okay, seven main takeaways. One, automate everything you can. Two, new assets are under tested assets. Three, dig into the past of your target. Four, always try to create workflows out of your tools. Five, share your tool ideas. Six, if you're gonna build a tool, make sure its output can be parsed and consumed by other tools. And seven, don't try to rebuild something unless you're gonna make it better. So yeah, that wraps up. If you have any questions or feedback, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Um, thank you for listening.